Hey there, everybody. This is Kenny. I'm along with Kenny Squared. We welcome you back to Sports on the Positive Tip, where we have conversations at the intersection of sports and faith. Kenny, <clears throat> Mason Miller, who is arguably the best closer on the market, right? If the A's were to trade him, he broke his pinky just like slamming his hand down because he was upset about his outing. Is Can, can Oakland still trade him? They say he's going to be out a couple of weeks. <clears throat> Uh, if I'm any team, I don't train him now because you worry that it's going to get worse. Okay. All right. <clears throat> it's not on his pitching hand. Is that, does that make it any different? Uh, maybe a little bit, but. Okay. I don't know. <clears throat> You're staying away from him. Yeah. Although if the Yankees get him, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Oakland should even trade. I mean, they'll probably get a lot for him. If they trade him, I think we talked about this last week because he still has five more years of uh, eligibility. Kenny, I, you know, let's 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 say in the American League, the White Sox, their record is twenty-seven and seventy-eight. They're fifty-one games under five hundred. What went wrong there? Um, they I don't know because they still have a good team. Like, if you look at players that are available, like most yeah. likely to get traded, yeah. by position. They have like four out of the top five positions. I have no idea what's going on with them. I, it, it is just stunning. I mean, in my lifetime, I don't remember a record that bad. I'm sure probably the, the Tigers a few years back, the Astros before they got good were really horrible. Um, I And of course, the 62 Mets, I, obviously, I don't remember. I said my lifetime, but, you know, they were, what, 62 and 120. I think that's still the record. But the White Sox might break that record the way they're going, especially if they start to peel off some of their their good players now, right? Yeah. Are we are we gonna see the longest losing streak possibly in like August, September? I don't know, man. I, I feel bad. Them and Oakland and uh and um Florida, I just uh not Florida, Miami. <laughs> I'm just like, what what is going on? But speaking of the White Sox. Dylan Cease, a nine inning, no hitter, 114 pitches. What'd you think about that? I love that he fought to stay in the game. Yep. And also good for San Diego. They haven't had a lot of no hitters in their history. So. No, only the second one. They were the last franchise to get one. Um, you know, they uh, came in 69 into uh, existence and it wasn't until Musgrove, right? A couple of years ago got one yep. in. now they've got two all right we got a lot to get into with baseball subway series basketball we're going to talk a little bit about tom brenneman um and olympics you ready to get this going let's go all right this episode of sports on the positive tip is brought to you by the tavern coffee house attention coffee lovers are you craving the perfect cup of coffee to start your day well look no further than the tavern coffee house it's located at 12302 Buckeye Road in Cleveland, Ohio. You can also check them out and order your coffee at the taverncoffee.com. Hey there, everybody. This is Kenny and Kenny Squared with the Sports on the Positive Tip podcast. Kenny, what a uh, week it was. And, and I, I just, I hate these two game series. Uh, with the Mets and Yankees, and uh, I hate two-game series, period. I it just, if you split it, you're like, okay. If you sweep, is it really a sweep? To me, it doesn't compare to a three-game sweep or even a four-game sweep. But the Mets took uh, all four games that they played against the Yankees this year. Um, what were some of your immediate thoughts and some of this series up for us? And I thought the Yankees had turned the corner, but I'm totally wrong on that. So. Talk about this series, and then let's get into a little discussion here on the Yankees, and I've got plenty about the Mets. Um, yeah, well, I I concur. I hate the two-game series. Um, I love next year. They're going with what we've talked about a long time, rivalry week. Yep. Um, I believe it's like the second or third weekend in May. Yeah, the Yankees right. are going to be playing the Mets. Um, a lot of other like regional matchups. They're not all interleague, which is interesting. So, like, you have, like, the Phillies and the Pirates playing, uh, Astros, Rangers. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, and luckily, it's a three. The Mets and Yankees play six times. Good. You know, this is only the second time um, since the subway, like, interleague play started 
that the Mets have swept the season series from the Yankees. Uh, you have to go back to 2013, a very uh, memorable year for the Yankees there. Um, but I don't know. Um, like there just seems to be way too many question marks and, and I don't know how to address them all. Cause like first I, I should have had this up. The Yankees production from left field has been putrid for the last six years. Um, you've got guys like Aaron Hicks that were out there. Joey Gallo's in there, Clint Frazier. Mm. Um, and it was looking really good for about two months with Verdugo, but it seems like he's just disappeared. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. Right now I'm saying like, because before we were kind of going with the discussion of like, is this guy is this guy part of next year's plans? Is he a good backup for Soto? So at this point, I'm like, I'd rather go with Dominguez or Spencer Jones than to go with Dugo. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, so left field's an issue. Yeah. DJ LeMayhew, can you stop grounding the ball to third base? Stop grounding into double plays. It seems like every single rally the Yankees had yeah. was killed by either like a weak ground ball to the right side or a double play ball. And I don't know, like, let me pull up DJ LeMahieu's numbers because yeah. at some point it's got to be, you got to start looking beyond him. And yeah. it's hard because I know he's got a lot of years left. I think he still has two more years after this year. Yeah. Um, but the dude's surprised. batting 179. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was surprised because I texted you early in the game one that I thought that Verdugo and LeMahieu had looked better, right? They both had early base hits in, um, in, in game one of that series. And then I'm like, what happened to both these guys? I, Verdugo, I'm a little bit more surprised about with LeMahieu. I'm, I'm suspecting LeMahieu may not be healthy, but Verdugo, I mean, the start he got off to, I'm just, I'm really surprised he's dropped off as much as he, he has. Yeah, and I guess if we're looking at a positive note, I think something to look forward to is Anthony Volpe, since the All-Star break, has really turned it on again. And I think one of his biggest issues is he can never really, like, kick that funk he was in. Yeah. And that tells me that he is going to continue to improve. The guy's great on defense, so he is a guy, like, right now in the infield, he's the only guy that I would say, you're definitely on the team next year. Yeah. Obviously, Gleyber Torres is a free agent. He's had a garbage year, too. Oh, then I don't know what you do that. with Rizzo. Yeah. I don't. I don't um, yeah. Yeah. But well, is, yeah. It, is it as simple as Kenny Rizzo and Stanton being healthy and coming back? Or, I mean, what's your solution I mean, here? It could be that. So, like, I don't know if. Because Stanton is definitely closer back than Rizzo. Right. Um, there's talk about him potentially, like, even not doing a rehab assignment and just coming straight up, and that can happen as soon as, like, next week, which would be great. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe what – um, like, I feel like they may not bring a lot of production, but they take a lot of the heat off of the other guys. Oh, oh yeah. Because, like – Stanton was having a good year. Like he he wasn't like mashing the ball every other at bat like he used to, but like he was having a good year. Rizzo was having kind of a eh type of year. But like I think they're like not even just the the fan scrutiny with those two guys, but also just in general with the lineup, the way that it's constructed, people are more worried about obviously one, two. Soto and Judge, Judge Soto, however you want to categorize it. And then um, and then you're like, okay, maybe I'll have a little bit of a break, but then Stanton's still a threat, Rizzo's still a threat. But now it's like, um, after those two, I mean, there's not much else to – like I know Severino yeah. kind of got some heat for saying it, but sometimes it does feel like they've got two guys and nobody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um both the Mets broadcast on Tuesday night and then the ESPN broadcast on Wednesday night uh, were very critical of Aaron Boone's 
lineup that maybe he should break these guys up or bat Aaron Judge uh, to lead off, uh, as the Dodgers have done with Shohei since Mookie Betts went out. Uh, what's your thoughts on on that? Because they had J.D. Davis hitting behind. And I, I love J.D. Davis when he was the Mets, but he's fallen off big time. Um, you could just tell he is not himself. He doesn't, you know, he's not a guy to come off the bench. And I think he's going to be moderately productive if he plays every day, but where's he going to play every day at? I don't know. But what what were your thoughts on that? I don't know if it's going to make much of a difference. Yeah, It just means they'll have two runners on base with nobody out. And then whoever you have in the three hole is going to ground into an ending ending double play. Well, I guess you wouldn't any right. double play, but right. Um, but let me, I have this up here. Yeah. Yankees OPS ranked by batting order position. Um, the top of their order is ranked 27th in the league. Second is ranked first. Third is ranked first. Fourth is ranked 30th. Awful. So our cleanup hitter is literally has the worst OPS in the league, whoever it is. Yeah. Um, fifth is ranked 10th. Sixth is ranked ninth. Seventh is ranked ninth. Eighth is ranked 23rd and ninth is ranked 10th. So like some of those aren't awful, but like your one, two, three, four at the beginning of the year was supposed to be really, really good. Yeah. Lead off has been kind of a mess since Volpe kind of went off. I think that Boone should look at putting him back up there, putting him yeah. back up there, kind yeah. of see if we can catch a little lightning there. Um, but really like they need somebody else to hit around these guys. Um, yeah. I think breaking them up isn't really going to do much. It's just going to, it's going to incentivize more people to do what, um, which, Credit to uh, what's his face? Uh, your manager there. Yeah, uh, I, I he handled Judge tremendously. He really did. I mean, but you could tell it's affecting Judge though too. He was he was a little frustrated in one of the at bats when they just kept pitching around him, and then he just he wasn't expecting that inside fastball, which normally a pinch that he would launch. And Deekman doesn't throw a hundred. It was probably ninety five, maybe. Um, and I was crossing my fingers with deep. I was texting you. I was like, you know, I know Mendoza knows what he's doing, but I I, I don't really trust Deekman in this spot, but he had nobody else, you know, to put in there, but that was quite a show of confidence. Um, I think that the Yankees probably, because I, I they definitely need, it's hard to address everything right at the trading deadline. I mean, it's only a few days away, and, and we could talk about that because there's already been some moves. Some of these teams are not waiting. Um, but it's almost like, to me, Glaber will probably get you something that you can use the rest of this year, whether that's a top-flight reliever. Um, I, I You know, I, I think if you flip G Glaber, because they're not going to bring him back, right? I, I just I, – I'd be shocked if they brought him back. Um I think you could get probably a really good reliever for him that you could use this year. Uh, I This was the first time in several years now that I think that Yankee bullpen is a little shaky, uh, aside from Clay Holmes. You know, um, because the Yankees always had a bunch of arms leading up to. Um, but man, oh man, the second game, the Mets are just smacking everybody that they put out there. They're, they're hitting home runs all over the place. Um and so I, I think they're going to have to move somebody to get some immediate help, you know? Um, but as far as the hitting, I, I just, I mean, I would not touch Dominguez. There's going to be a lot of teams that'll say like, let's say one of the guys from the white Sox, right? Luis Robert, he can hit, he could probably come to New York and hit right with the Yankees. And uh, you could plug him into your left field hole there, um, which is kind of a hole now. But, uh, you know, oh, God, the, the White Sox are going to want prospects for any of these guys they give up. And who's the Yankee num number one prospect? I would not, you know, trade him even to go after it this year. I don't know who's going to be out there for the Yankees to really get. I think you could flip Glaber for a top flight reliever. As an example, you could probably flip him to the Marlins. The Marlins ain't going to care. They'll pay him for these last couple of months, and then they'll let him walk and get, you know, a Tanner Scott that'll really, really help that seventh, eighth inning, right, um, and can close on nights when Holmes can't. Outside of that, man, I'm not sure. You just don't want to 
break the team down, you know, you're not Tampa, right? Tampa trading a Rosarina and Glasnow in the offseason. They seem to always be able to replace these guys. They're an aberration, I think, to the rest of baseball. You know, we start to peel off these top prospects, especially with the Yankees finishing where they do most years. It's hard for them to get these prospects, you know, uh, because of where they draft at. So, um, but I don't think it's how, you know, listen, this is also the same team that just crushed it the first couple of months of the season. Now they've had some injuries, but why can't they turn it around? I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm probably a little more confident they could turn around than looking at you right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, because this has been a bad stretch. I mean, was it like seven weeks? That um, you know, it, it's been a, it's been a bad stretch. Yeah, I mean, I think they've got to make a move of some of like a significant piece. I do like the idea of flipping Glaber. Um, it's a trade that happened earlier today. The Orioles uh, traded Austin Hayes to the Phillies for uh, Sir Anthony, whatever the heck his last name is. Dominguez, yeah, um, he's really good. He, he actually so, he's got a big arm. He's he'll, that, I was surprised the Phillies let him go. I saw that come across, but they picked up a good player though. Yeah. So like a trade like that, I think could work. Yeah. Cause also Glaber needs a, he needs a fresh start. Um, yeah. Go, yeah. go out, grow, grow a beard, rack in Milwaukee or something like that. Well, uh, Milwaukee would be a good landing place with Christian Yelich, right. Um, you know, on the shelf right now. Um and and who knows if he'll be back this year? He's got a back issue. Um, whoever Glaber goes to, they're, they're only going to keep him for these couple of months, you know. So if it's not a contender, it'll be a team like the Marlins that'll say, "Hey, give me a couple of prospects, and we'll take Glaber off your hands as well." And yeah, you can take Tanner Scott, you know. Um, I I, I have confidence the Yankees can turn around, I, but I want to say this: if if you're ready for me to go to the Mets. I mean, the Mets are, uh, it's its its just been a, a a tale of two seasons here, almost four seasons with the Mets and Yankees, you know, where the Yankees start off like they did and now they, you know, like this, and the Mets were horrible in May. The Mets are 30 and 13 in the last 43 games. And I'm going to give Mendoza so much credit here because he has proven to be a big league manager. I mean, you had said when they first signed him, you said, you know, I think he's going to be good. It's always, it's always a roll of the dice, right? You just don't know. Um, but I have to say, and it's still, you know, this is middle of his first year, a little more than half, but he's made these adjustments that I just don't see the Yankees making right now. As an example, you know, how he kept Diekman in the other day, um, uh, he they he chose Vientos over Brett Beatty. That's worked out beautifully. I mean, Brett Beatty was the golden boy of the Mets farm system, and you know Vientos has just been uh, great. Um, you know he stuck with Jeff McNeil, and that wasn't easy because it was him who brought up uh, Jose Iglesias, who's been outstanding. And he could have easily said, "Well, McNeil, you you go into the bench. This guy's playing second base every day." You know, and he didn't do that. You know, he stuck with McNeil. Uh, similar to the way, though, they're sticking to DJ, and it's a little different because McNeil's probably about six or seven years younger, you know, and both are, are batting champions. But McNeil now is just like he's killing it, you know, and, and we kind of knew he would eventually come out of it. Um, I had my doubts, actually, and, and I was saying, hey, maybe we flip him for Glaber for the rest of the year, you know, um, but he's come out of it. Um, then he puts Lindor in the leadoff spot. And I don't know what prompted him to do that, but Lindor has just been outstanding. And so was Nemo up until this week. Nemo's in a deep slump now, but um, putting him at number two and Lindor at number one, I mean, that's when the Mets went on a tear. And Lindor, I mean, I heard Eduardo Perez. I, I don't agree with him, although I'd love to see it happen. He says, you got to put Lindor up there in the MVP conversation. Slow down. I don't know, man. <laughs> With those, I mean, the guy, I mean, he's already now batting over 260 and he's got 21 homers, 60 something RBIs, a lot of stolen bases. Um, he put now this was interesting because I this was in my notes early this morning. He put Adrian Hauser, took him out of the rotation, put him in the bullpen. But the Mets DFA and Hauser today. Um, I'm not quite sure why his last two outings weren't that great, but he 
he had probably about 10, 12 outings in the bullpen where he was great. Um, he, uh, he gave uh, Dediel Nunez, who went on the IL uh, today as well, um, you know, he put him in eighth inning, some bigger spots, and the guys really paid off. Brought Jose Buto back up, put him in the bullpen, and he was great. Last night, he pitched three shutout innings against the Braves, and it was important to hold a game at two to two. You know, uh, the Mets wouldn't have been able to win that last night without him. So he's he's taking some chances. And they've turned that team over a lot. There's been a lot of other moves, but he's stuck with the core. And I think um, Boone is sticking with the core, but I, I don't get the sense that Boone kind of just um, knows what to do. And I'm not saying he, he's an excellent manager, but I just get the sense he doesn't know what's my next move here, you know? Yeah, I feel like... I feel like Boone sometimes is a little too hands-off and like yeah. kind of is just like, I trust that these guys will get out of their funk. And sometimes the quicker way to get out of your funk is to change what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and yeah. like, whether it is like, say judge lead off or, I mean, Volpe's the hot hand. He should be leading off. Yeah. Um, and Yankee fans will be irate if we hit Sunday and this team has won one out of their last five games. Yeah. 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 Swept by the Mets, losing two out of three to the Red Sox. God forbid if they got swept. Like, yeah. It, yeah. I don't know. It's just, yeah. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't advocate this, but there was an article that said if George Steinbrenner was still alive, man, everybody would have been fired, you know, through this. Um, Boone would have been long gone, you know. And I don't think that that's the way, but the Red Sox are for real, man. And they made a move today. Um, you know, I after watching Chris Sale last night, though, I'm like, why did they trade this guy? You know, I know he had been hurt the last few years, but I mean, he looked like the Chris Sale of like 2018 and 2019. I, I didn't realize this, you know, six straight years or seven straight years. It had to be between the White Sox and the Red Sox. That he finished like in the top six in the Cy Young voting every year. He was that consistent. And then he got hurt. And and he'd been inconsistent since. And now he's healthy. He looked great last night. I mean, you know, uh, it was just the uh, Lindor uh, two-run homer off him last night. It was all the Mets got. They only had two hits. And I think he struck out nine or ten. Uh, we'll get to the Braves in a second because they're they're in trouble. Um, but I agree with you, man. Suppose the Red Sox sweep this series this weekend. You know, um, and and they're right on their tail anyway, you know. Um, I don't know. I I just think that the Yankees have to make some sort of move going into next week. I don't think there's a move out there that's going to fix everything, but maybe there's a move out there that gets them one more bat and one more bullpen arm. You know what I mean? Yeah, because like, I think if you get an infield bat, you get a bullpen piece. I think Yankee fans will be fine with that. Yeah. Um. Cause like the rotation is, is fine. Yeah. I mean, sure. We would love to see an upgrade there, but like, aside, like Derek Cole hasn't fully gotten back yet. The the guy isn't going to pitch against the Mets at all this year, unless they meet in the world series. So we'll be good there. Um, Yeah. But I, I, I'm with you. Like, I'm fine with it. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I don't know that they need starting help. I don't think they do. I get, I think you need another bullpen arm. Um, and you need one more bat um, to take take some of this relief off. Uh, let's jump around the majors in a little bit. All of a sudden, out west, you texted me uh, this early this morning. I, I didn't – this must have happened late last night that uh, Tampa had flipped uh, Randy Rosarina over to Seattle. What, what were your thoughts? Oh, <laughs> you're clapping because he's out of the – listen, Tampa and Toronto are not going to be threats to you this year anyway. Um but I was I was a little bit surprised that they wound up still trading him. He's still young enough and not making a ton of money yet. I was surprised that um, that they flipped him to Seattle. So what were your thoughts there? Well, I mean, you said it. I don't think they're a threat this year. Um, <sighs> praise the Lord, he's out of the division. <laughs> um, my only concern, though, is, okay, so right now the Mariners are three and a half games out. Yeah. Of the last wild card. Uh, 
it would pain me to see the Yankees play the Mariners at all in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. Cause like I'm still haunted by the 2020 ALDS where the yeah. dude just kept getting hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah. so aside from that, I think it is a great move from the Mariners side. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Cause like I know the Astros are back in first place because of course they are. But like you have to think that you have a shot to kind of overtake them this year. You've got yeah. Luis Castillo as your ace. You've yeah. got a good rotation. Yeah. yeah. Um, like actually, I believe like they rank top in pretty much yeah. offense. I think it's in pitching categories. Yeah. So yeah. like they needed the boost, and I think it's good. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah, it also there's starting to be rumblings about the the race start the sell off a few extra pieces. Yandy Diaz is also on there. Um, yeah. Isaac Paredes. I know I've seen a couple things with him. They'll probably so, trade both of them. <laughs> and then next year they'll win a hundred games. You know, that, I, I don't know what it yeah. is. <laughs> well, and that's yeah. the thing. They'll trade them for like yeah. rando prospects. No one's heard of. And then that rando prospect is hitting like 45 home runs and yeah. striking out 150 guys. Like, come yeah. on. I mean, they made the one exception all these years with Franco um to sign him to you know one guy to a long-term deal and look how that worked out you you better believe nobody else on tap is getting a long-term deal anytime soon oh. you know? i got more on that too so yeah, yeah yeah this not directly so um randy and rosa randy was traded today it's also randy land night in tampa i don't what? know what that means but yeah. um, like bobblehead or something yeah yeah uh, Brett Phillips was traded one day after his Devil Rays basketball jersey giveaway. <laughs> and Wander Franco was placed on administrative leave the same day as his snap back, snap back giveaway for fans. Ironically, the fans, it was just 14 and under fans. Uh, oh, so, was, um, oh, my gosh, that's horrible. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. So yeah. I don't know any. I know one Rays fan. Um, I don't know if he still follows them. Uh, it's a friend from Elam. Yeah. Um, he was actually like born and raised in Tampa Bay. I yeah. feel bad for the the few other Rays fans that, that are out there. It's hard. You definitely, if you're a Rays fan, you definitely have to root for the uniform and you wait till this new stadium opens, you know, where they'll probably be able to start to keep some of these players. But um, they, I mean, you just root for the uniform because the players aren't going to be there long, you know, uh, it just, yeah. it, it, you know, um, uh, let's see what else is happening in the majors. I, we talked about Christian Yelich. That's big for, the Brewers, hopefully he's not out as long, but reports are that he um, it's his back and he may have to have surgery, which will might not just keep him out the rest of this year, but a good part of next year. Um, and and Yelich was having a great bounce back year. Um, and, and staying back out in the West, AL West, uh, don't look now, but here come the Texas Rangers. They came out of the break hot and they're what one game under 500, I believe now. So, um, and who knows, maybe they get Jacob deGrom. Maybe there'll be a Jacob deGrom sighting in August. Um, and Kodai Singa comes back tonight. So um, I'm excited about that. That's probably why they let go of Hauser. They had to make room, um, you know, uh, for for Singa. So, um, you know, baseball really, really heating up. Anything else on your end uh, that surprised you around the league? I, I'll just say that the Braves, um, I mean, their outfield last night was Rosario. I'm forgetting who was in center field and Lori, uh, Ramon Laureano was in right field. Uh, it wasn't Michael Harris. He was, he's hurt. Albies is hurt. Um, both Austin Riley and I sent you Matt Olson stats. I couldn't believe I had to stare at the screen and see if they had it right. 13 homers, 44 RBIs, 54 homers last year. I'm not sure what happened to him this year. You know, um, uh, you know, they've got, uh, uh, Nacho Rivera or Navarra, something like that, and uh, playing second base. I, I just, I, I you you didn't recognize oh. a lot of Braves team. Yeah. Um, center field was your boy, uh, Jared Kelnick. Yeah, right, right, right. And he let off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's come back down to earth. He's batting two forty two. Um, I think he has like fifteen homers, forty something RBIs. Um. The Braves are definitely hurting, and uh, they made some terrible base running mistakes last night. I think Whit Merrifield is a is a good pickup for them, um, but he got thrown out at third base when um, he shouldn't have he shouldn't have ran to third base. He um, 
he stole second. That should have been good enough. He could score from there. And uh, he got a little bit greedy and he gets thrown out in the ninth inning like that. Um, you know, but the Braves are a little bit of a shell of themselves. Um, that's definitely surprised me. I mean, the Mets could pass the Braves if, you know, they take three out of four in the series. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, hey, you, you want to talk about Tom Brenneman for a second? Yeah, let's do it. You know, um, we need to mix in a little bit more faith. In in this spot, I think we get carried away with sports, and that's that's fine, right? Um, this is a faith moment for me, Ken. Um, and I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, I it, so many places biblically, whether it's David, whether it's Paul, uh, so many great biblical figures get not just second chances, chance after chance after chance, and that's how God works, right? And um, but I think also. We saw, we saw, or we see in the Bible, especially when there's repentance, right? There has to be full repentance, I think, in order to get that full grace, full forgiveness, you know, from God. And, and, um, and I just, when I saw the Tom Brenneman thing, you know, I was like, yes, you know, um, now neither one of us condone or we think what he said, we, we both think what he said was awful. But I think we'll both agree that Tom Brenneman, like you and I, are human. And he messed up. I got to say, man, of people that have said bad things and messed up, I really didn't see someone own it as strongly as Brenneman owned it. To the point he's, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny clip now where he's apologizing and he still calls Castellano's home run. Um, he couldn't stop apologizing. He went to a lot of LGBTQ meetings in different cities he met leaders apologized um took a job i think calling puerto rico baseball um calling some high school sports i mean tom brenneman was number two football announcer at cbs um uh, uh number two at fox for baseball or not not cbs but for fox and baseball as well as in uh, the nfl when Joe Buck would go to do the World Series and playoffs. It was always Brenneman that filled in. Um, so you're talking about this big-time broadcaster who makes a mistake, owns up to it, repents, and finally four years later gets a second chance. That's biblical to me, man. I think he deserved it. Um, I think on full display, this is how God works. He's talked about his faith throughout this um, ordeal. Um so th those are my thoughts. I'm anxious to hear your thoughts, especially on repentance. And is this a teachable moment for us? Yeah, well, you had said um, it's kind of humorous. It actually, that that home run call started the legend of Nick Castellanos because yes. now yeah. it's like he hits a home run anytime something really tragic happens. Yeah, And I know. like, it's crazy because also... Um, I believe he got a big hit after Biden stepped down or, or what? after uh, Trump got assassinated. It was, or almost assassinated. Really? Um, I didn't know that. I believe it was one of the two. I have to look it up, but um, I have this verse here. It's uh, Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Hmm. Um, Amen. I do think it's a very teachable moment for us because um, in, in a couple ways. First, I think it's a good example of kind of how that verse is talking where like God's not mad at us still about what we did yesterday as long as we've repented for it and kind of made things right. And I think Tom Brenneman has done that. Like you said, like yeah. he's sincerely apologized. He's gone and tried to better his understanding of where he was wrong and everything like that. Um, but I think it's also a good testament to how long it could potentially take to be fully redeemed. Because I feel like a lot of times in our world today, we want like the instant redemption. Yep. Like in our minds, he was fired. What was that like? July of 2020. We would have wanted him back on like, the number two team for Fox uh, October of 2020 or something like that. Right. So uh, 
I think it also goes to show the the importance of that consistency because he could have easily been like, you know what, this was a fun run. I'm sick of trying and that's it. But I think he did a, he showed what that path looks like and it's not quick. It's definitely a slow process. Yeah. And I think like we see this also with any type of pastor that has a moral failing, whether it's like, yeah. pastor that cheats on their wife or it's like having some kind of crazy affair or whatever um people want like the instant redemption but god doesn't always work in that way right sometimes it does take several steps um sometimes it takes years to see where you are on the other side so yeah um i'm excited for him yeah, I don't know how much I'm going to be listening to him just based on like oh CW. There's going to be so much college football on. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be turning to the CW, but it's he's it's a national broadcast. He's going to be doing national games as their lead lead uh, play by play guy. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, good for him, and um, I yeah. hope that everything continues to work well for him. Absolutely, absolutely. Well said. Well said. Great scripture. Um, let's move over. Because WB, uh, nice segue, Warner Brothers Discovery. And this NBA thing is turning into actually a little bit of a mess. So um, I don't know if you saw a word came down. As expected, TNT, Warner Brothers Discovery. I'm going to say TNT, but their parent company is Warner Brothers Discovery. Um, They are now suing the NBA. And so here's just a quick recap. And I'm anxious to get your thoughts here. Because the NBA uh, deals are expiring. They're keeping ESPN, ABC. Great. Uh, But they're bringing in NBC and they're bringing in Amazon. But there was a clause in this deal that TNT... uh, Sorry, hold on one second. Let me just uh, say this. Uh, um, there, There was a clause in the deal where if TNT match the Amazon offer that it would go back to TNT. So TNT the other day did match. They had a certain amount of days to go ahead and match it, and they already did. Now, the NBA, though, said, well, you really didn't. Um, and it's two things that they are saying that why they would want to go with Amazon more. Now, we'll come back to what TNT has meant to the NBA over these almost 40 years now that they've had it, but they can't match the upfront money that Amazon has. Let, let's just face it. Amazon has uh, much deeper pockets than Warner Brother Discovery. Amazon has, is one of the more valuable companies in the whole world. So they're saying that t- two things money-wise, they can't match. If the NBA needs to go for more upfront money, that Amazon could give them what they want. If they want $20 billion up front, they could give that to them, where Warner Brothers Discovery can't. Second thing is, the NBA is looking forward to when this deal expires, as you come up on 11 years, a long way away, but that Warner Brothers Discovery wouldn't have the increased money that it will take you know, to stay on after 11 years. Now, why they're worried about what's going to happen after 11 years, I'm not sure. But the streaming service is kind of more the way to go here, right? As, in terms of what the NBA is thinking, because here's the third reason. Right now, you can get through Max, through Warner Brothers Discovery, TNT, TBS, whatever. You can get that in a, about 100 countries across the world. Amazon Prime, you can get in over 200 countries across the world. So NBA is also thinking globally, you know, that this is a better fit for them and a better deal for them. And they picked up another streaming service in Peacock, right? When they signed here with NBC. So so anyway, now Warner Brothers Discovery is taking them to court and saying, wait a second, none of that was in the contract. You know, the only clause that was in there is that we have the right to match and we we did it within the time frame. So it's going to be interesting to see where it lands. I see both, both sides. I, I think if you ask any fan, Kenny, any fan of the NBA, they care less whether these games are on Amazon. I think any fan of the NBA wants to see them keep TNT because TNT has just been ingrained in us all these years. When, you know, the NBA was only, let's say, on NBC and you only saw, you know, a Sunday game, 
Well, once you got basic cable, well, you saw a game on Thursday night. You saw a doubleheader Thursday night. You saw a doubleheader on Tuesday night. And TNT covered it great. They had Marv Albert at first, and now they have Kevin Holland. They have the best announcers. But, of course, the main course for TNT is the Inside the NBA show, which everyone loves. And we can't imagine the NBA without Barkley, Kenny Smith, Shaq, Ernie Johnson. But, you know, the commissioner is saying we need to now move forward. And and so I don't know that he's listening to the backlash of the fans because anything that I've read and I really read comments on stuff. But this this story I have and I haven't read one comment that says, OK, we're excited about Amazon. I think people are excited, especially nostalgic from basketball in the 90s. The Jordan era, I think there's a lot of excitement of it going back to NBC. Um, you know, and, and let me just say this real quick. Let me give what the lineup would be right now, and then I want to hear all of your comments. Right? Let's if it stayed the way it is, there'll be a national, at least one national game on every night. And here's the other thing that's not so good is when something is on Amazon or even on Peacock, they put in clauses that the local broadcast cannot happen. And so so the local, let's say like MSG, and the Knicks are a good team, right? So they'll be on a lot. So the, let's say on Thursday night, the Knicks are on Amazon. Um, they're not going to be on MSG. And that's taking revenue away from the local market, you know, as well. But, you know, it's padding the pockets of the NBA. But I think you're like me. I, I much rather would watch, and this is no knock on any of the announcers. I like all of them, but I'd rather watch Mike Breen and Walt Frazier do a Nick game, you know, and I know that I'm not going to have that forever. You know, we're not going to have that forever, but while we still have that, that's what I want to see. You know, um, I like when they're on the national game, but I don't want them to be on national game every week. The Knicks potentially will be right. As will probably the Lakers and, and the Warriors and the Celtics and and all of the the big teams, so um, Amazon will have Thursday nights once football is done. They have football now on Thursday nights. As soon as the season is over, they'll switch to having an NBA doubleheader on Thursday nights. They'll also have Monday nights once Monday night football is done. They'll have uh, probably not a doubleheader, but some Mondays they say they'll have doubleheaders. NBC gets the All-Star game. Uh, they get the All-Star game and All-Star Saturday. Now, that's been on TNT forever. Before it was popular, it was on TNT, you know? Well, not the All-Star game, but um, the NBA Saturday night. That was on TNT forever. Um, but they also will get uh, – NBC will also get uh, a Saturday game as well as uh, Sunday nights after, after the NFL season is over. So in the time being, they'll do Saturday afternoons and they'll, once the uh, season is over, they'll have Sunday nights, but they also are going to do Tuesday nights. They say most of those Tuesday nights are going to be a doubleheader on Peacock. ESPN pretty much stays the same. ESPN, ABC, they keep the finals. They do Wednesday nights. They do Friday nights. They can do Saturday evening, Saturday nights, as well as Sunday afternoon. So every night is covered with the national game. This is how popular the NBA has gotten. All right, your thoughts now. I kind of, I hopefully I untangled what 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 is kind of now a little bit of a mess. But um, what are your thoughts? I'm gonna start with this: <clears throat> seventy six billion dollars. That is a lot of money. It's a lot of money, man. <laughs> um, and like, based on AAV, basketball players are making more than anybody else right now. Yeah. And I would assume that that's only going to go up. Yeah. Um, like, are we going to see a guy start making a hundred million dollars a year? Like, that's maybe. that's in, that's insane. Yeah, maybe. Um, and like, I understand that streaming is the future as of right now. Um, I mean, we've seen it with the NFL. The NFL is now going to be streaming three Christmas Day games on Netflix. That's crazy. Words yeah, that you that. wouldn't have heard 15 years ago. No. <laughs> um, and and also like the the NFL is starting to expand as far as like they're doing more Thursday night games. 
they have the Monday night double headers every so often. Um, so I think like having a national game every night, it could be good, but also it could end up being oversaturated to where you're like, oh, wow, the Lakers are on again for the eighth time. Maybe Brian will get in and then he doesn't, you don't feel like watching. Um, Cause that's the only reason why people would want to watch the Lakers. Yeah. Like I guess this year and potentially next year, assuming right. LeBron is there for another year. Um, but it does seem like the NBA is kind of doing TNT a little bit dirty. Yeah. And like, to me, that tells me that there is a lot more shady business going on, but also like there's the importance of honoring what you're saying. Um, despite the fact that you can win more money. Um, I, I go back to, I'm going to tie in a little story here that I, that I heard it was a past or a professor at Bible college that told us this story that there was this lady that wanted to lead worship at his church. Um, and he was like a struggling pastor working a second job to meet ends meet because the church wasn't supporting him full time yet. And he said, sure, we'll try out. Like, lets her go for a song. She's awful. She also dropped in a $20,000 tithe check, which would have like, basically at this point would have like paid the other half of his salary, essentially. Right. Um, And so then she said, oh, well, can I still do it? And he said, no. And wow. she took the check out, ripped it up in his face and walked out the door and never came back. Wow. But then the church kind of embraced that because he was kind of a new pastor there. wasn't there for that long. And as a result, the church started to get that momentum and started to grow. And within a year he was working full time or he was serving in the church full time. Um, and I say that to say, I feel like sometimes when you chase the money, you don't realize the ramifications of the people that you're hurting along the way hmm. inside the NBA is gold. It's like yeah. the top, like, and I used to love baseball tonight. I mean, you you remember yeah. back in like yeah the early days of baseball tonight when yeah. when it was popping yeah. But like, if I were to pick a pregame show, oh. like I don't I don't really watch the the Fox one with A Rod and Jeter and Big Poppy. I just see the clips where Jeter is shading Ortiz, and I love it. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, if I'm gonna sit down and watch a pregame show, I'm not watching baseball tonight on ESPN. I'm not watching uh the Fox pregame baseball or football for that matter. I'm not watching um, CBS and their pre what is it? NFL today or whatever. Yeah. I'm watching inside the NBA. Yeah. And, yeah. and all of those guys, especially like, I feel like they have such good chemistry with, with each other. They've been together for so long. It works so well. And also like, I feel like some pregames it's like, you don't have players that have actually been there that are actually the ones talking so much. Yeah. And I feel like between Barkley, between Shaq, like you have not only good players, but hall of fame players there. Mm -hmm. So it's a shame. And I really do hope that the NBA can kind of figure out a way to keep it. Um, I'm assuming yeah. they can't, um, but it's unless just. Unless they're forced to, you know, yeah. unless, unless, a, you know, I'm sure they're going to hear this quick. You know, um, but I mean, pretty much they they thumbed their nose up and said, well, all right, you match the money, but you can't match these other things, you know, um, and they can't just yet. Right. But, I, you know, the the fans, they, they're not listening to the fans on this. It's too much money at stake. You know, yeah. we're still going to watch. That's the thing. If it's on Amazon, we're going to and we don't have and somebody doesn't have Amazon. They'll figure out a way to watch. Right. Uh, Peacock. I don't have Peacock. Am I going to figure out a way to watch? I'll just wait, you know, for the next night. <laughs> it's going to be a game one every night, you know? So I, I just, um, but it's a shame. And, you know, TNT, this has been great. You know, what's great about that show is that they don't script it. You know, uh, they just, they just kind of, it's just three guys talking basketball. And Ernie Johnson is just so good at what he does. Um, it's just three guys making fun of each other and talking basketball. Um, Kenny Smith, that's the closest it comes to the scripting when he goes to the big board and, you know, um, uh, I'm sure he prepares for that, but um, uh, there's no way they match that. Any any other, that is the only, I mean, to your point, 
that's the only pregame show that I watch, period. Or halftime, usually we, what, you turn to something else or you go get something to eat. If a game is on TNT, particularly the Knicks, halftime, I'm staying. <laughs> I want to hear what they have to say, you know? Yeah. Um, they're, they're just that good, you know, um, at what they do. And it's a shame that Barkley has said he's going to retire because you would think Amazon or NBC would say, because they can't take Ernie Johnson. You know, TNT has said, no, he's staying because he does baseball and they still have the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, but you would think they'd say, well, I'm taking these other three guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whatever. Here, you guys sign the check, whatever you guys want. But you're coming to work for us at NBC or Amazon or whatever. And then maybe put, you know, another host there. I don't know. Uh, but then maybe you still can't create it with a new host. Um, all right. We'll keep an eye on that story. Uh, you asked as today, the Olympics are starting and, uh, we've got the, actually some games started yesterday, I think, right. Women's soccer, I think started yesterday. Um, but they have, uh, they have the opening ceremony. I think it was going on this afternoon, but it'll be televised tonight. Um, you asked about favorite Olympic memories. And I think we've done this before. Uh, I'll just say mine real quick, and then um, then you can talk about yours and and what what we're looking forward to. I, I still, unfortunately, I can't get the 1972 one out of my head. Still, you know, I just and that was when the 11 Israeli athletes were killed. And I, I've said this before, Ken, and um, we never really did this as a family, but as the Olympics when it came on, every family not I shouldn't say every family in America, most families in America stopped. And whether you like sports or not, you sat there and watched it, you know, for the three hours that it was on during prime time, or sometimes it was on during the day as well on the weekends. Um, and I'll never forget it. It was a Sunday night. And and just, I, I kept asking, you know, my dad, what, what is this going on? And he's like, this is not good, you know, and watching Jim McKay, who you're used to hearing sports from now turning into kind of a newscaster to, to talk about. And, and they have on camera these guys with machine guns running across, you know, the stands and everything. It, it was just crazy. Um, and, you know, terrorism, we think has only been a few years. It goes back a long, long way. And it was on full display in 1972. Unfortunately, that's one of my memories, but also 1976 for a better reason. Sugar Ray Leonard, Bruce Jenner just dominated the games. And I used to love to watch boxing. I guess they still do boxing. I couldn't tell you who, uh, boxers are. I think I'll try to watch more this year than I have in a while. But, um, you know, I am looking forward to Simone Biles and that team. I'd like to see her make some more history and, and come back. They're calling it their redemption tour. But of course, man, i rooting hard for the U.S. team, basketball team to win. But I tell you what, man, there's competition. You know, you saw how they've had a tough time in this pre-tournament against uh, South Sudan and Germany. I mean, the world is kind of caught up to the U.S. There's so many stars sprinkled throughout some of these teams. But hopefully they're practicing more together and, you know, they'll get their act together. And there is six games they have to win for the gold medal. So um, so we'll see. I'm looking forward to that. What about you? Um, well, before I get to that, this is a minor note. Yeah. Um, no pun intended. Um, the... Uh, Yankees announced today that Jason Dominguez has been activated, um, which he's been dealing with an oblique. So a little spark, maybe. Maybe we see a Martian sighting up at the major league level. I don't know. Um, <laughs> all right. So I'll give a few. Um, I think it one that sticks out to me is I'm pretty sure I remember actually seeing um Michael Phelps like break the gold medal record. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I I always go back to that. I thought that was really cool. Um obviously like being able to see Usain Bolt for like the eight seconds that you could actually see him was always quite the treat. Um and then also just like uh seeing basketball every single time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I, I agree. Like the gap between America and everyone else is definitely like shorter. And especially when you look that um, you can make the argument is LeBron the best player on this team? 
I mean, he lit it up against South Sudan there towards the end. They saved him, um, yeah. But I do think with LeBron, and I'll kind of end that on that, um, I think that LeBron is designed for tournaments like this. Like the in-season tournament, he was great for because he doesn't have to do like a 20-day grind. It's just like a short period. I think he'll I think he'll thrive. Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I am looking forward to the Olympics – um, seeing like the men's basketball again. Um, there is a inspirational story that I'll share later that I think will be an interesting one to keep an eye on. Um, but then also, uh, Shikari Richardson, kind of yeah. a forgotten name, I think yeah. will be a lot of fun to watch. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah those are yeah, those are my things. And we're gonna talk more Olympics than we have the last few years. So I'll make sure I'm watching at least, if not you know, three hours a night, at least the highlights. And, you know, uh, Shikari Richardson is going to be very, is going to be fascinating to watch her. Uh, Cause she yeah. totally, totally blew it a few years ago. Um, you know, just by testing positive for marijuana. I mean, you know, so I, I mean, she is, I, she is fast. I'll just say that. All right. Ready for some inspiration? Yeah, let's do it. Steve McMichael is mine. Um, Steve McMichael, you may or may not know this name. He was on the 85 Chicago Bears and was a, not good. He was a great defensive tackle. In fact, he had 95 sacks in his career, which is still third most in NFL history from that position. Typically, it's the defensive ends that get most of the sacks. He was so big and strong and fast that um, that he has still has the third most. Uh, for that position in NFL history. Um, after he retired in 1991, he became a wrestler and he, you know, I never watched wrestling, but he was on WWE and became kind of a little bit of a star in that realm. Um, Steve McMichael though, for some reason, maybe it's because there's, I think five or six other Chicago bears from that defense alone that are in the hall of fame. And plus Walter Payton, um, it's like they passed him over because he was on such these great teams. I mean, they only won it all one time, but that those teams were dominant during the regular season, during that era, 80s to very early 90s. They just couldn't get past the hump in the playoffs. Um, but they had the one remarkable season, 1985. Um, in 2021, sort of out of nowhere, he was feeling off. He was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease which, you know, you have no movement of your muscles and you, you basically get very sick and you're basically given two to five years to live. Um, he signed a DNR. Um, if, if he went into cardiac arrest or he couldn't breathe or something like that, he didn't want to be revived. And um, earlier, uh, sometime late last year, uh, he had an episode that was really bad. And his wife, he couldn't speak. Um, so his wife asked him because his lifelong dream was to get to the Hall of Fame. He was on the, he was passed over for the regular Hall of Fame. And just like the baseball one, they have the Veterans Committee. And he was on the list, the short list for the Veterans Committee to vote on. And so he was practically dying. And his wife leans over and tells, tells him, you know, you have this DNR but the hall of fame hasn't called yet. Um, if you want me to tear this up and I call an ambulance to save you right now, just blink your eyes once for yes. And he blinked his eyes once for yes. So she tore the DNR up. Um, he barely made it. The ambulance got there. Um, and, and he made it out of this episode. He had this really bad throat infection and he made it out of this episode. And sure enough, uh, early January of this year, um, Richard Dent, who was one of his teammates on that defense, uh, calls him up and um, him and his wife, and he lets them know that the Veterans Committee has voted to put him in the Hall of Fame. And so amazing story there of uh, wanting to live long enough so that he could see his dream of going to the Hall of Fame. But now the challenge is getting him there. Um, I think it's like a 400 mile trip, but they were able to uh, rent a medical helicopter, a medical plane, I think, for him. Um, and I never watch the hall of fame ceremonies. I think they're great, but it's not one something I like, you know, baseball one. I didn't sit around and watch that. I'll see some of the highlights. Um, 
but this one I think I'm going to watch, you know, uh, because that that's going to be very inspirational. Um, he can't speak. He speaks through, you know, the computer thing. He'll type something in as he can, and it'll, it'll say what he can say, but it's going to be a crazy emotional moment. Um, but he lived long enough to see this. So, uh, he's going to live a little longer and he'll be there. I think the hall of fame induction ceremony is probably next Saturday. Cause I think the jets play in the hall of fame game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Steve McMichael, my inspiration for this week. Oh, that's, that's quite the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, mine is actually, I'd said it's Olympic based, um, it's a guy, uh, an Olympic swimmer, Adam Peaty. Um, he is with Great Britain. Um, he was there in 2020, or I guess would have been 2021, uh, at the last Olympics. Um, and then a couple years later, he breaks his foot, so then he has to kind of sit out for a little bit. And then he comes back, and he's just not 100% there. Um, and then he also had some issues with... Um, like his wife and ended up getting divorced ish. Um, and then he just started to have real bad mental health and was going downhill. Um, so he took some time to step away from, from swimming and also like got also very heavy into alcoholism. And I just want to read this cause it's going to be a lot better just hearing his words. Um, cause like we've talked about this before, how sometimes athletes um they have a hard time in the recovery of significant injuries because it can be so lonely yeah um so i spent most of my life kind of validating getting my gratification or life's fulfillment for my results that led me to some dark moments and it's really living your life on a quantifiable measure of results 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 instead of how the people around you are maybe um how am i how's my son how's my family all these things actually do matter. It's not about your job. It's not about, it's not just about performance. And to get that, the only place I found it was at church. And so he really found the Lord through this really deep, dark moment of his life. Yeah. And for the first time, he felt like he wasn't just on stage, that he could be real with people. And, um, and so he also got a tattoo right in the middle of his chest with a cross that says into the light um, and is back here in the Olympics um, competing. Hopefully he's trying to become the first player since Michael Phelps to win the same event, three different Olympics. So wow, it's got to cheer for, I know he's not American, so people might have an issue with that. No, I think that's I, awesome. I joke, but yeah. But yeah. Adam Keaty. Yeah. So uh, tell me again, cause I probably missed it. What, what country is he from? Uh, Great Britain. Great Britain. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. I'll be looking out for him. Wow. That, that's a great story. I love it. Love it. All right, man. Um, Lots to talk about next week. Um, We'll have a week of Olympics under our belt. Talk about that. Baseball continues. We'll have the trade deadline behind us. Um, We probably could start to sprinkle in a little NFL. A little early for me, but yeah. we could, we could start to talk about, you know, uh, how Aaron Rodgers looks good and how the Jets need to do whatever they need to do to get Hassan Reddick in here. Um, that, that just that story just took over this past week. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. So for now, ready to take us home? Take us home, man. Yeah, this is Kenny Squared Ed. Kenny. With Sports on the Positive Tip. We'll see you guys next week. Absolutely.